Good morning and Merry Christmas. I hope your day is going well so far. Uh, today we are on Let the Bible Speak. We are wrapping up the series we've started. Uh, I think we started it 10 weeks ago now called The Questions of Jesus. Uh, now, I want to tell you a couple of things about this lesson before we get started and really get into it. First of all, this lesson is not a traditional Christmas sermon per se. Uh, but I think it's really very fitting uh, for today's setting because to me, this kind of year and there's something about the holidays and, and everything else that really makes you think about who you are, you know, do a lot of self-reflecting. And um, I, I think that's a lot of what this lesson today is. So it's not a Christmas sermon, but I think it makes a lot of sense here today. So here's the second part of this I want to tell you up front. This could be the most important sermon, lesson, study that you'll ever hear in your life. And I don't say that because of anything to do with, you know, my skills of presentation or persuasion or anything of the sort. This is about the power of Jesus to convict the heart and pierce the soul with the sword of his word. I know that uh, in, prep in preparing for this lesson and studying what I've studied, I have been very affected by all of this, and I hope that you are too. So the last question we're going to be looking at to wrap up this series, it comes from Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. What shall a man give in return for his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? Now, I want to put this in context, so I, I want to read this whole section here. This is Matthew 16, starting in verse 24. Jesus is speaking with his disciples, and he's really challenging them to think about the cost of, you know, what it means to be a Christian. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. So I'm going to take a really close look here at verse 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? It's a question about value, right? How valuable is your soul? You might know the song, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind. He was way behind looking to make a deal, right? <laughs> anyway, I grew Grew up part of my childhood in Georgia, so heard the song quite a bit. Um, in that song, Johnny, uh, this little fiddle player, uh, this kid, he trades his soul for a fiddle, fiddle of gold. Well, is that, you know, is that a fair trade? Is, is your soul worth a big chunk of, you know, pretty valuable, expensive metal? But is that all it's worth, really? I think we need to understand what we're talking about, first of all, when we're talking about the soul. Uh, so I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about soul for a second here. Uh, of course, we're not talking about the music genre. Uh, we're talking about that 
transcendent existential part of yourself that makes you, you. Now, Plato was the one, around 350 BC, uh, Plato was the one who really set the standard in Greek philosophy for how we understand the soul. Uh, the Greek word for soul is the word psuche. Uh, and he wrote all kinds of stuff about the nature of the human soul. Um, in his understanding, the soul was something that was unique to mankind. It was something eternal. It was something independent of the body. Uh, it was the essence of self and it was also the source of morality. It was the reason that you know how to distinguish between good and evil, right? Now, Plato, he divided the soul up into three components. He divided it first into the reason component, which was represented by the head, the logos. Then there was the passion, the thumos, which was represented by the chest or even the heart. You had the appetite, the eros, that was represented by the stomach. So this is what drove humankind. It was a combination of logic and reason, uh, of passion and desire, uh, and also of appetite. Now, when you look at scripture and what scripture says about the soul, I, I think you get somewhat of a different, but also a somewhat familiar picture. So in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, we see that the word soul, uh, the Greek word psuche even specifically, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this is referred to as the Septuagint, uh, in that passage in Genesis 2 verse 7 when it says that God breathed life into Adam and it says that he became a living creature. Well, the Septuagint translates that as uh, the, the living psuche, the living soul. At that point, Adam had a soul, whatever we might understand that to mean. Uh, albeit in Genesis chapter 1 verse 24 the same thing is said about animals so uh, maybe there's some discussion to be had about that and the distinction there but um, the soul was something important it was this life-giving thing it was uh, that which animates you that which allows you to live as, as a independent autonomous creature secondly we see that the soul comprises the essence of identity alongside the spirit and the body. Um, the soul, by the way, of those three things, the soul, spirit, and body, the soul is the only one of those that is not affected by earthly death. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, uh, Jesus warns his listeners, do not fear the one who can destroy the body, fear the one who can destroy the body cast the soul into hell. Um, there's something about the soul that transcends that earthly death. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, this is what Paul says to the Thessalonica people. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have that division that's represented by uh, by Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians. And you almost think, you know, was Plato on to something? You know, it's also possible that Paul was talking to these Thessalonians uh, who lived in what we would consider modern day Greece. Uh, maybe he was talking to them in terms that they would understand because Plato's philosophy essentially became Greek philosophy on the topic. So when you look at the soul, we know that it plays a key role in your personal identity. Uh, it's that which transcends death. It is that which comprises the self. It's you. The soul is what makes you, you. So with all that considered, what is it worth to you? There's a, uh, a story back in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 25. We're not, we're not going to read it right now, but I, I'd encourage you to Give it a look sometime. In Genesis 25, starting in verse 29, you have the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, even before that, there is a story of their birth where you could see from the very beginning, they were destined to be pitted against each other and rivals of sorts in this sibling rivalry. And in this story, Jacob is the, is the cook. Esau is the, the hunter. 
So Esau is out hunting and uh, Jacob is sitting inside and, you know, cooking away in the kitchen, so to say. And Esau comes in after a long day of hunting and apparently Esau is just desperately hungry. Esau is the older one, by the way. Esau is the one to whom the majority of the inheritance would have gone in the case of, you know, Isaac's death. So Esau is the one who's set to receive the majority inheritance here. Uh, that's what's known as his birthright, right? Because he was born first. Even though they're twins, Esau came out first. So Esau, the older one, comes in after this long day of hunting and just desperately hungry. Well, Jacob has put together this stew and there's some bread as well. And Esau says, give me some food. And Jacob says, uh, only if you give me your birthright and I'll give you some food. And Esau says, okay, sure, <laughs> you know, whatever. He was hungry, you know, and when you're hungry, hunger makes you do things. So, so he sells his birthright away. And, you know, we always look at this story and we think, you know, what a fool. Why on earth would Esau give away something so valuable in order to have a cup of soup? And, and you know, w we look at that story almost mockingly, thinking about how dumb Esau must have been. But isn't that what we do all the time? All the time, aren't we just as guilty trading away our eternal souls for things that are meaningless and things that are temporary? I want to tell you the story of a, of a man named Nicholas Perry. Uh, his online, uh, he, he, online, he goes by the moniker Nikocado Avocado, which by the way, if you're going to have a, an online uh, persona, what a name, like, <laughs> that's great. I, I love the name choice. Um, but Nicholas Perry, you know, he, he was born in Ukraine in the year 1992. Pretty early on, he was adopted by a family in Philadelphia. Uh, so. He was brought into the U.S., uh, and after his initial education through high school, uh, he, he worked part-time at, uh, at a Home Depot. Uh, he was actually a very talented violin player as well. Uh, he wanted to be a, you know, do something with the violin professionally. And so he, he got some freelance gigs around where, where he lived in Philly, uh, but it wasn't going the way that he wanted it to, and so he decided that he was going to move down to New York City and he was going to try to perform on Broadway. Uh, maybe that was down in the orchestra pit, maybe performances themselves, but he wanted, to, he wanted to perform. After trying to break through what he discovered was a pretty crowded industry in that area, uh, he was struggling and he really stagnated. By 2014, he does actually find some success as a YouTube content creator uh, creating vlogs about the life of a vegan in New York City. But after some time there, he was frustrated with the lack of success uh, on that front. Uh, also some fr frustrations evidently with the vegan community. I don't know, but one way or another, he decided that it was time for a change. And boy, did he make a change. Um, he locked on to this track of the social media fad known as mukbang. Uh, now, if you don't know what mukbang is, you, you would join the millions. I, I didn't know what it was. Uh, but evidently, what this is, is people re will record themselves, you know, have a camera or something set up in front of them, and record themselves eating something either really disgusting or something really spicy or maybe an enormous portion of food or something like that. And it's sort of like a, like a vlog, but they're doing that while they vlog, you know, and there's some entertainment value to that. I don't really understand it, but evidently it was quite popular. So he locked on to this fad and trend and he was really successful at it. The result is that when his channel started to evolve to this mukbang where he was, you know, he would have this large bowl of, you know, something like 20, 30, maybe 40 servings of noodles, and he would eat the whole thing in one sitting. Pretty impressive, you know? And his YouTube channel exploded. He got 3.7 million subscribers. Uh, his channel has 761 million views. That's just astounding. But meanwhile, his weight went up to 350 pounds. 
Uh, he had sudden onset of some really severe health problems. Um, his life was not ruined by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, what he effectively did was trading years of his life for a little bit of fame and a little bit of money. Now, the point here and why I'm sharing this with you is not to disparage Nicholas. Uh, in fact, I, I would say I'm, you know, I'm one to talk, right? But the point is that he is a product of, and I would even say a victim of, a culture that has grown absolutely obsessed with appetite, with the eros, right? This is what Plato thought was represented by the stomach. It's that which we crave, you know, whatever pops into your mind in that moment, I want it, let's do it. His success is an indication that, you know, that's where we are. Our culture has bought into this pinnacle of pleasure idea. Now, I want to introduce a word to you. You may know it, you may not. The word is hedonism. Hedonism. Uh, you can find this word, at, you know, it's defined in Oxford dic uh, dic Dictionary. Excuse me. It's defined as an ethical theory that pleasure is the highest good and proper aim of human life. Think about that for a second. Pleasure is the highest good and proper aim of human life. In other words, your whole life is centered around what can I do in this moment to make me happy? What can I do in this moment to please myself? And that is what your life is about. Your life is a series of choices in which your success is determined by how happy you can make yourself. Now, if you can't tell already, that's quite the recipe for disaster. But, you know, in the absence of religion, which, you know, in Western society, we've certainly had this evolution over time where, uh, you know, the importance of religion and religious institutions has certainly been pushed to the side at the very least. And in the absence of religion, this hedonism becomes a new predominant philosophy. It becomes a new ethic. And you know what? I mean, why not? If you don't believe that you're beholden, to anything greater. If you don't believe that you're beholden to a higher power, if you don't believe that your life has any greater purpose, then yeah, you know, why not just try to do whatever pleases you in any given moment? Now, there are several natural problems with that. One is we're not very good at doing it. We think we know what's gonna make us happy only to be severely disappointed oftentimes. The second part of that is that if everyone did what they wanted, oftentimes those desires conflict with one another. One person may want to do harm to another person, which obviously that person doesn't want. One person may think they want to do something that other people think is reprehensible and not good, right? Not ethical. So, this is what Paul, I think, was talking about, by the way. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, he said their God is their belly. He's, he wasn't necessarily saying that they all just stuff themselves and you know, gorge on every food that enters their sight, although maybe that was part of it. It was that you know, they're so obsessed with pleasure, they can't see that there's any greater purpose to life. Their God is their belly. All they're concerned about is, what do you want in this moment, right now? And the result of that kind of philosophy, the result of this hedonistic ethic, is that thousands of souls, every single day, are traded away for lives full of Netflix and coffee and vacations and football and scrolling through social media. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I think pleasures have their place, some pleasures anyway. I am convinced, I've said this before, I am convinced that KFC is a gift directly from, from the heavens, <laughs> you know. But, probably shouldn't do breakfast, lunch, and dinner KFC, you know, just as a general rule. Because it turns out there are other repercussions of that. So there's something to be said about moderation, and there's something to be said about there being a greater purpose to life than just what pleases you right in this moment. And, you know, credit to all the Gen Zers out there, by the way. For all the, uh, you know, people getting on to the younger generations and 
talking about how much they don't understand and all of that. You know, I'm just barely in the, the I guess, the youngest end of the millennial category. And I can't tell you how much I've heard about the, oh, Gen X this, Gen Z that, and everything else, all this generational shaming. And you know what? I think people in Gen Z are catching on to this. I think they're being fed this ethic, this philosophy, just do whatever makes you happy. And I think they're realizing that it doesn't work. Because I think they're seeing their peers who try their best to make themselves happy. And I think they're seeing how often and how frequently it fails and falls apart. They're seeing their peers taking their own lives. They're seeing them in utter depression. And they're seeing these patterns that are not healthy and not good. And they're realizing that it doesn't work. And they're yearning for something more. The writer of Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, starting in verse 10, he writes, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. The writer of Ecclesiastes acknowledges that pleasure, it, it is a gift from God. All these things that we have to enjoy in the world, at least the things that are good anyway, these are gifts and blessings from God to be enjoyed, at least in moderation. But he also recognizes that pleasure, it's not the source of ultimate meaning. So there are a lot of people who I think have sacrificed their souls on the altar of pleasure. I think there are a lot more who have traded away their souls in exchange for what you might call naturalistic virtue. So this idea of naturalistic virtue goes something like this. I don't believe in God. I, I, I don't think there's anything to the whole Christianity thing or, or any other religion for that matter. But you know what? I, I think generally we should work hard and we should try to be good people and not try to hurt anybody else. Just generally, maybe we should do that. Stephen Hawking was born on January 8, 1942. By the time he was, uh, let's see, that'll be 20, 24 years old, he was awarded PhDs both in applied mathematics and theoretical physics from Cambridge. Uh, and his work throughout his academic career was really remarkable. Uh, despite, by the way, this diagnosis of this crippling neurological disease that slowly made him less and less mobile and vocal and everything else, um, he was diagnosed at the age of 21 while he was doing his grad work. Uh, but he persisted, he, he got to doctorates, and he continued this work in his academic career. And his work drastically changed our understanding of things like black holes, time travel, quantum mechanics, string theory. He lived a really incredible life, but he, he wasn't a Christian. In fact, he was an outspoken atheist, uh, quoted as saying, there, there is no God. I'm reminded of this verse that we looked at earlier. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? and forfeits his soul? Or what, shall a prof or what shall a man give in return for his soul? It doesn't matter how much fun you have, how many academic accolades you receive, how much money you earn, or how many good deeds you do. If your soul is not sanctified, if you've not been cleansed of your sin, it is not going to make any difference in the end. You want to know how valuable your soul is? Look at the cross. The cross proves how valuable your soul is. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest, made manifest, right? 
in the last time for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Don't waste your life. And don't trade your soul for some cheap alternative because God knows and believes that you are worth more. So we go back to the question. What shall a man give in return for his soul? And the answer, of course, is absolutely nothing. No amount of money can buy it. No amount of pleasure can sustain it. And no amount of virtue can redeem it. But God gave everything for it. For you. For your soul. Because he wants to be with you for eternity. So here's what I'd like to challenge you with today. What would change today... What would happen today, what would it look like today if you started acting like your soul has immense value? What would that look like? What would happen if you started acting like your soul has immense value? One last passage to read to you. This is from Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. I want to thank you for the time and attention that you've given me today. I know that what we went through today was, was heavy stuff. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope that it challenges you. I hope it uh, leads to some really important self-reflection, uh, some existential thinking about the purpose and meaning of your life. Um, I, I hope it leads to that. And if there's anything that we can do to help you in that, uh, feel free to reach out. I want to tell you before we go about some of the resources we have to help you in that. Uh, first of all, we have a Bible correspondence course. It's a seven-part workbook series uh, that allows you to get acquainted with Scripture uh, and to start discovering your place and your meaning in this world that God has created. Uh, if you want to take part in that, uh, and you don't have a Bible, we offer those to everybody, totally free of charge. Um, it's a hardcover ESV, the same translation we use here on the show. Uh, again, if you want to participate in that or if you need a Bible, feel free to reach out. You can reach us by mail by the address uh, at the address on the screen there, P.O. Box 372, that's in Marquette, Michigan, 49855. You can also find a lot of this information and information about the local churches in this area at letthebiblespeak.net. And if you don't know, we also have a podcast. We have a podcast called Let the Bible Speak UP. It's distributed on Spotify. You can also find it on Podbean. Just search Let the Bible Speak UP. I want to thank you so much for joining me on the program today. Uh, I know it's been a whirlwind of a series, and I think this is a perfect way to close it out. Thank you so much for joining me today and over the last several weeks. I hope you have a wonderful week and a wonderful Christmas. May God bless you. Yeah.